and uh, on the cloud. Um, it's great that we're all finally here. I apologize for the delay. Um, and um, and uh, people are still asking where to find us. Let's make sure that they all find us. Um, okay, great. Okay, so now that we get uh, we get uh, the the backup solution working in record time, um, let uh, me briefly reintroduce myself. A lot of you may have seen me before. I'm Conrad Carding, and I have a super cool new T-shirt that I just received in the mail, which is it says Neuromatch Academy on the front, and it says something on the back. Can anyone read that? I, I think I know what that says. It says it won't be much work. Why does it say it won't be much work? Uh, fake news, exactly, as some people say. So, um, so, so yes, um, it, everything ends up being a lot more work than you think or I think or anyone on the team thinks. And uh, why don't we go to the next person? Megan, do you want to introduce yourself next? Sure. So hi, everybody. Uh, some of you probably have seen my face before, but uh, just in case you haven't, I'm Megan Peters. I'm also one of the co-organizers of Neuromatch Academy. And uh, my background, well, my research is uh, on um, probabilistic models of perceptual decision making, basically, uh, with a focus on um, perception, metacognition, consciousness. Uh, so I do a lot of psychophysics and behavioral experiments in humans. And I also do some EEG and some MRI, fMRI to try to understand the neural and computational correlates of, of these processes. And uh, my PhD also was on uh, something a little bit different. It was on Bayesian models of multisensory integration from a causal inference perspective. And so uh, we'll have a little bit of stuff to talk about there today, I hope. Um, but uh, one, of, uh, one of Conrad's maybe not one of your most cited papers, Conrad, but one of the big ones that I became familiar with when I was a student was actually written with my PhD mentor. And so that was the, the uh, causal inference in multisensory perception or causal inference in perception paper in 2007. So that was my first introduction to this type of Bayesian stats and this type of Bayesian modeling. And, uh, and so then I did that in my PhD and now here I am. So that's my background. Um, uh, great. Uh, cool. So, so I want to encourage everyone to turn off your videos, if you would, uh, unless you're one of the speakers, just so, so that we can track who's here and who's speaking and so forth. Uh, great. Well, thanks, Megan. Thanks so much. This is like your day. Um, <laughs> why don't we hear from Eric next? Hi. Uh, yeah, my name is Eric DeWitt, and um, I, along with Megan and Conrad, have been uh, helping to set up and run this show. I'm a researcher here in Lisbon, Portugal, uh, and my area of interest is reinforcement learning, decision making. Um, and I've worked uh, both in humans and, and um, monkeys during my PhD, and, and now I'm working with the smarter, smaller, furrier animals mostly. Um, I'm also a member of the International Brain Lab, and I'm very interested in open science and larger scale collaborative science ways we can sort of move to answering bigger questions. Um, and I, I have a, a long standing participation in these kinds of summer schools. I helped to run one in China for many years and also helped start one in India. And now I'm really happy to be here talking to you guys. Conrad, you're muted. Conrad, you're muted. <laughs> uh, I can't even Zoom today. So our, our third guest today is John Krakauer, who I am very much looking forward to. John. Uh, so uh, thank you, Conrad. Don't be such a liar. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, uh, my name is John Krakauer. Uh, I'm a neurologist and neuroscientist. I have quite broad interests that go from uh, the study of motor learning and motor control in health and disease. Um, I'm also interested in cognition, philosophy of science, uh, and general skeptic in the room. <laughs> uh, I, I, I guess I can I can confirm that. So, <laughs> so, so so why don't why don't we uh, jump right in? So what we will be doing is we will 
first prioritize the questions that are about the bigger understanding of Bayesian statistics. So Bayesian statistics and the kind of why model that's behind Bayesian statistics is a very peculiar way of thinking. And a lot of you will have experienced that in the tutorials. There's, there's like a lot of, it, it sometimes feels like you're doing inception and yet for a lot of people, it's, it's really a very useful source of, of, of thinking about how the brain may work. And because of this conceptual underbelly, I want to make sure that we get to those conceptual ideas of like, what is Bayesian statistics? What can it do for us? What are the prompts? What is hard and so forth to get to these things first? And there will be a lot of questions, or at least potentially a good number of questions about more like technical details. We will get to those, but we will get towards those towards the end of the hour. Okay, so why don't we directly look at the questions that we're having? So the, um, so, so, so let's, let's start here with this question, which is a question from Vasishta uh, Polisetti, who asks, if the brain itself is Bayesian, why does Bayesian logic seem so un un unintuitive? Why is it so difficult for people to understand probabilities? That is just a fantastic question to get started with. Who, who wants to take a crack at this? I, can I go first, actually? Because I, I agree with the sentiment um, about uh, understanding probabilities and, and uh, cognitively trying to like grok probabilities is very difficult. And I've experienced this personally. Like when I was an undergrad, when I was a PhD student, the first couple times that I ran into statistics and took statistics over and over and over again and trying to think about probability and random variables, I found it counterintuitive and it was hard. Um, and, uh, and so it was, it was really, uh, I, I totally agree with that. Um, and, and Conrad, you're saying that you almost failed at high school statistics. I took a stats class pass fail once um, because I was afraid of the grade that I was going to get. So I completely sympathize with that. Um, yeah, and I think it, it seemed like this, like a big set of perfectly meaningless tools. It's like, they, they, like, here's how you do a t-test and like, here's how you throw a couple of like coins or something like, okay, why? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think that was, that was my, my problem is that I was trying to think through, looking back on it now, I was trying to think through understanding probability and stochasticity and random variables with the same uh, approach that had served me well through calculus and algebra and this kind of deterministic approach to, to, um, to mathematics. And it's just a completely different way of thinking about it. And as soon as you stop trying to shove it into the same box, it becomes much easier. So I, I, I don't know that uh, I can speak to, to the other part, which is uh, why does Bayesian logic seem so unintuitive aside from just my own experiences in trying to understand, um, trying to understand probability with the same mindset as uh, as the rest of mathematics that I had had up until my first real classes in probability, and it would, it just didn't work. But let, let well, me, uh, can, I, can I, cause I was going to ask Megan a question cause Me Megan actually studies metacognition, right? That's, that's what you're interested in. And, uh, so I, I did in my PhD, I did neuroeconomics. And one of the things that we were very interested in is the relationship between optimal models like Bayesian models and what we might think of as as the the deviations or the you know the the ways in which we don't behave optimally so for example we're very poor at, at recognizing how to deal with probabilities that are very close to one or very close to zero um but interestingly to me like that doesn't tell me much about how the brain works in a lot of ways it tells us how it works at some kind of metacognitive level i think um, because when we actually are dealing with those probabilities, it's not normally that we're actually thinking about something that we've experienced 0.0001% of the time. It's rather that somebody told you, oh, by the way, you know, there's a 0.001% probability that uh, you're going to win the lottery. And, and then you have to do something metacognitive. So I was curious, you know, how you think about that, because that's sort of a space you're in. Yeah, I, th I think I think this is a good point that 
the distinction between thinking about probability from a frequentist perspective and thinking about probability from a Bayesian perspective, a degrees of belief perspective, those are not often spelled out quite as explicitly. Um, it's much easier to, for me to think about it in a, a frequentist perspective in some ways that, you know, I flip the coin a hundred times and five of them come up this way. But the degrees of belief perspective uh, and interpretation of probability is, is the harder one, I think. Um, but it's related to, yeah, as you're saying, like the, the metacognitive aspect, because that's ultimately what the, we can think of the output of a metacognitive system might be is a degrees of, of belief that, you know, this perceptual, uh, the result of this perceptual computation is likely to uh, reflect truth about the external environment or that I inter like that the interpretation that I came to is likely to be correct. That's degrees of belief. So it's almost like the thing that we are supposed to be, have a system that is optimized for, which is metacognition, is, is ultimately the version of probability that is the hardest for us to understand from a cognitive perspective. I don't have an answer. But well, I, I, I was, I, I was thinking, um, so I, I did a little bit of work looking at confidence, right? And confidence is basically an estimate of, of how likely you think you are to have gotten something right. Yeah. And, and you can look at, at a, I mean, they've actually done this studying sort of uh, sub, sub, uh, subliminal perception or, you know, like barely conscious perception. And, and you ask somebody to make a series of choices and they do better in making the choices than they are at telling you how confident yeah. they are in doing it, right? Yeah. So, so I guess that was sort of the thing I was getting at. Like just because the brain might be able to actually interpret the statistics of the world and maybe even do it in a Bayesian way in some cases, it doesn't mean we necessarily have access to that. Like we might not be able to say, uh, oh, I can think on that. I can, I can cognate on that. Anyway, that was sort of the thing I was- No, I, I totally agree. There is type two noise. Um, and that just because you, you have a type one decision that's right, but I, so I what, what do, what do uh, uh, Megan, uh, you mentioned type one and type two. Uh, yeah. what, what, what do those two terms mean? Oh yeah, good, good call. Thank you. Um, so what, what Eric was talking about is this, this idea of a confidence judgment in a decision. So uh, we talked about um, a decision like today in the tutorials, uh, it was all about localization of an audiovisual percept. Um, and or like a, a flash and a beep or something like that. And so the type one decision is the decision about where the thing came from. Did the flash come from here or here or here or here? And the type two decision or the metacognitive decision would be uh, having decided that the thing came from here and not here, how confident do I feel that I got that right? Uh, and those are kind of, it's a decision about a decision, which is what it makes it metacognitive. And that, and because it's a decision about a decision, there could be noise that happens in between the first decision and the second decision. And so that's what I mean by type two noise is that, which goes to what Eric was saying, which is that maybe there would be additional components of suboptimality or additional noise or something else that kind of gets in the way. I think this is a good opportunity to sec into Tao Hong's questions. Yeah who asked, could you suggest some reference on how animals explicitly incorporate prior in the potential neural mechanisms in value-based decision-making? For example, the use of on-task ambiguity versus risk, Ellsberg paradox, and so on. People have studied Bayesian inference and perception sensor motor learning for a long time, but it seems like Kahneman's research has people thinking that humans are entirely suboptimal in probability outside of perception and motor learning. And I think that would be a good question for Eric, given what he said a little while ago. <laughs> well, so I guess I think it's a little bit uh, more complicated than that. So uh, uh, let me let me see. If you ask, um, so there's an experiment that I think uh, Zach talked about today, if I'm not mistaken, where um, subjects were asked to make a decision that in in some sense was a, an economic decision, right? They had to point uh, or at a target and there was, and this is, correct me if I'm wrong, Conrad, this was in the version of the talk I saw last, but I didn't rewatch it today. Um, anyway, I'll describe the experiment. Subjects are asked to point at a, at a point on the screen and they, uh, they have some uncertainty, right? You're making a rapid movement. I, I, I do this a lot. I don't always touch the screen in the same place. Then I put uh, two zones on the screen. One is positive, you're going to win money, and one is red, you're going to lose money. And I ask you to see where you're going to point. Now, in order to do this, now, 
admittedly, I'm giving you an analogy in the motor domain, you have to use your own motor uncertainty to estimate where your finger is going to land. And now if there's a red zone on the screen that's really bad, you need to adjust where you point to um, in order to actually avoid the bad part and sort of do the good thing, which is to, to land more often in the green zone and then a red zone. And it turns out humans do this basically optimally, Bayesian optimally. So that's great. So there's a connection here now between decision making and the motor system. But what about if we think about how humans or animals make choices when those choices are being derived primarily from their experience? So, you know, an example would be a, a mouse making a hundred choices in some crazy task we experimenters put, put it into, or the kind of choice you make when you have to decide where to go for coffee or, or tea in the morning. These kinds of, of choices, which are a bit more abstract, like, do I want to go over here? Or do I want to go over there? Do I want to have, you know, chicken or fish today? Um, these choices are also in, in a direct sense, economic choices. They're what do you value? What do you think will be good? And you're going to use the information that you've experienced in the past. So uh, did I have a good time at this restaurant or did I have a terrible time at this restaurant? And you can actually integrate that kind of information. And when we look at um, studies that have looked at this more experiential learning of value, you actually see that humans are much closer to optimal. Now, why, why might this relate to the sort of discussion Megan and I were having earlier? A lot of the work that Kahneman does is done with sort of questions framed in a classic economic context. We ask you to read some story in language. You're using a lot of metacognitive skills. You have to translate relatively abstract things into the system, the underlying system, which for hundreds of millions of years was just wandering around producing behavior. And it didn't have economists trying to sort of trick you into doing things with special framings of the question. So when we look at the kind of errors humans make, especially in these contexts, they're often more likely to be very non-optimal in contexts where we have to use this kind of metacognition and translate information about which we have very little experience. And now stepping back, we might think, well, generally speaking, if we look at the spaces where evolution has had a long time to operate, uh, op optimize the neural circuitry to sort of do things in an op optimal way, like you know, motor control, um, it's very likely that the system has had time to sort of fine tune the representations and may be able to do something uh, quite, quite optimal or quite close to the Bayesian model. But actually, you know, in domains where humans work often, we're dealing with social spaces that we invented a few hundred years ago or, or societies that we invented a few thousand years ago. And it, it's created a, a really complicated and extremely high dimensional and abstract object that we basically learn in a few years as a kid. So I think it's not so surprising that it's kind of easier to break that. Um, so I think that's that's the framing I would I would use. I, I want to just share some observation from my lab. We never we never like really published anything on that, but it's a strong observation, which is when I put people into scenarios that feel very automatic, the kind of stuff that John says my lab shouldn't be studying all the time, uh, then we have people basically go through the same target like a thousand times. It's very intuitive. You can kind of do it while listening to very loud techno music, which is great music. And you kind of keep going like that and like you get really, really good at it. And it's very Bayesian how you're in that situation. But if I do very similar experiments where I'm like, okay, look on that one axis, there's something hidden, find a way of like fine tuning that. So basically in the first mode, if I bring in 10 people, the graphs of them look indistinguishable. If I do the slightly more cognitive thing, which is like on that same axis, there's something hidden and like just try and like find it by doing multiple searches. They, everyone's different. Some people go like, oh, let's try from the left. Some people try from the right. Some of them use like a, level, a really clever strategy. As a group, they seem they're doing extremely nicely, but, but, but there is this funny transition and I don't really understand that. Well, I don't understand this conversation at, at, at all, quite frankly. In other words, honestly, this is, you know, I'm going to try and be positive, Conrad. I, I think, you know, it, people talk about the notion of surplus ideas that 
get into conversations, to help us along with the conversation, right? And I would say that you probably wouldn't need much surplus if you were talking about the experiments you did with Daniel or Q integration um, and, you know, easy Bayesian problems when you have one prior and, and one, you know, observable variable. And then, you know, you, you, you begin to complicate it. You go into causal inference, you generate, you know, generative models. And then what happens is those get quite complicated. And then you have to come up with ways to solve those complicated problems with some kind of approximation because it's difficult otherwise. But yeah, the, the mathematicians thing, need jobs. Yeah, but the, but the thing is, is that the thing is, is all these conversations, as you yourself admitted, metacognition, going to the cafe, uh, or not going, and then, you know, Eric saying that actually when we go to the cafe, we're optimal, I think is kind of laughable. I'd like to know what study showed that. But let me give an example of how difficult it is to come up with explanations. Um, and how are we going to cope with it? So you say, Conrad became a heavy drinker because his father was an alcoholic. And you go, ah, yes, of course. He had this prior, you know, this example. Okay. And then someone else says, well, Conrad doesn't touch a drop of alcohol because his father was an alcoholic. <laughs> right? And you go, ah, yes, that's very plausible too. Right? So it gets to your point, which is we don't really know why the very same circumstance can lead to the exact opposite decision. And so I'm saying that once we start getting to cognition, like you gave in your example of people going off piste or off recipe when you give them the opportunity, is suddenly you have to pour in all these surplus psychological terms that Bayes itself can't contribute. And so what happens is that it becomes an instrument of formalism for testing of models, which is great. But the psychological thing that you're actually going to try and formalize has to get its meaning and its conceptualization from somewhere outside the Bayesian framework. That's the feeling I get here in these conversations. Yeah, so, 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 so fast, Everyone should know that John is a really good friend of mine. So, so he gets like exceptional right to make jokes about my family. It wasn't uh, a joke. I wasn't. I was giving that, that's a famous example of, of how you can have two equally plausible explanations that we understand, and yet which one is true? You see, so, that's, so, I, I, so, I was making no statements about your right, right, right. family. But, 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 but let's, let's, let's zoom out and and focus on the question because I think at a high level, John gets to an, a big and an important point. You know, like in Bayesian statistics and Meg and Eric interrupt me if I get that wrong, but like what we generally assume is that the brain solves the problem optimally. And we also assume that we can understand what the problem is. And at some level, our formalization of what the problem is is something that we fill with like our beliefs about the domain. And in that sense, it kind of opens up a backdoor to which we can potentially overfit the data. And like we can basically in our mind play with models until things work out meaningfully. And, and, and that is a real worry in Bayesian statistics, no? I, I mean, I think one of the things you said, and, and I don't know, maybe it's it's a place where I, I don't know which side I fall on, because I, I like, I mean, I'm friends with all of these wonderful people here, but I know John pretty well, and I, 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 I sometimes, I, I guess I would sometimes play his role if he wasn't here, um, but sometimes I, I would try to play devil's advocate for the other side. So, I mean, I think that um, one of the things that you just said, Conrad, is really important. I mean. The Bayesian formalism, if nothing else, if nothing else, it allows us to make a very precise statement about what we think is going on. So, and let's think about this first, not in the brain, but just as an experimentalist, thinking about the problem the brain faces, right? So we, we ask, what is the, thing, the optimal thing that an animal could do? We have to describe what information we think the animal has. 
what sources of uncertainty are in that information. By using the Bayesian formalism, we're, we're forced to at least make that clear. And I think that's actually something, John, you didn't do, right? You gave us a little nice line and, and, and you tried to sink us by saying, ah, well, the only piece of information in the world was whether Conrad's father was an alcoholic and whether or not John, you know, whether or not Conrad was. But, but in fact, we know some other things, right? We know the statistics of how many alcoholics there are in the world whose children become alcoholics or whatever. And so I think one of the things about the Bayesian formalism is that, is it asks us to put that kind of information in a precise way. It says, well, what is the uncertainty we have? What is the relationship between one event but, and but, another? But Eric, right? just if I may interrupt you, I, but that's as an experimentalist from the outside. You see, this is yes. the thing that happens all the time. Are we talking about Bayes outside the brain or Bayes in the brain? I was talking about what led Conrad to be a teetotaler or an alcoholic. What you've just gone and done is talked about being an experimentalist who knows about all the alcoholics in the world. This is the kind of toggling that I just find very disingenuous. But, 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 but hold on, hold on, hold on. Like, like, I, I, let's, this, this is, this is a, an argument about degrees and I, I, I think it's not precise. So what we have on the one side is like, arbitrary storytelling like i tell like some story and in that story it's the bayesian thing to infer one thing versus i tell a completely different story and it's the other one i sell my stories as models and whatever data i have i will always fit the model there's the other extreme of that which is let's say q combination between two different cues that are both similar on the same axis say vision and proprioception when it's about the size of something like in the work in the older work by like Ernst and Banks or like a uh, work where it's about estimating the location where you can use what you know from before what we had in the tutorial combination of vision auditory uh, uh, combination in those cases I don't think John your argument holds because like we have a very simple model which is Gaussian noise on things and that same model's been used for like literally hundreds of years. but I but I never I mean just no 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 but just just to be clear I I said this morning I I have no problem with finding empirically you know when Ernst and you know you know when when the famous experiment when they measured sensory noise and they measured proprioceptive noise and then you found that you combined them optimally and that's fine and it, and it gets to the point that we started with which is isn't it interesting is when we're not being cognitive we end up really being quite good at bayesian optimization and as soon as we start getting cognitive we make all sorts of anti-bayesian mistakes all i'm trying to say and i thought that if, when i looked at this is that there's a divide between seeing whether a person is Bayesian in the sensory motor system versus what does it mean to have psychological models of how we think. I don't think a Bayesian perspective is going to explain the conversation we're having now on Neuromatch, right? In other words, I just don't see how the disagreement we're having is just not the framework to explain what's going on between us right now. Whereas when we reach for the keys on our computer, I'm very willing to say suddenly we're doing something Bayes optimal. You know, there's a philosopher, Dretsky, who talks about this, that the neuroscience of walking to the fridge and opening the door versus the neuroscience of the reason why you went to the fridge to open the door is you were feeling a bit peckish and you wanted, they're different kinds of science and different kinds of language. And all I'm saying is that I have not been as convinced by the Bayesian framework for why I went to the fridge to try and steal, you know, a pudding at midnight is the same as the way I balanced myself and opened the door to get the pudding out of the fridge. And it works in one. And as you yourself said in your lab example, it doesn't seem to really help me very much in the latter. That, that, that's all I'm saying. John, can I ask a, a question to follow up on that? Do you, do you feel that the, the reason that it doesn't work for the higher cognitive types of decisions is, is due, due to a fundamental disconnect or a fundamental inadequacy. Like it's the wrong type of thinking for this type of, of higher cognitive or these kind of reason-based um, motivations for our behavior. Or do you think that it's, it could potentially work 
We just haven't figured out how to specify all the inputs correctly yet. So it's interesting. I mentioned this earlier today um, uh, when uh, Carl Friston gave a very interesting in-depth interview with Sean Carroll on Sean Carroll's podcast. Um, and he was introducing, you know, the free energy principle, Bayesian brain, and, and, and trying to talk about, you know, theory of the brain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was kind of interesting that at one point, it became clear that the framework, a little bit like the one I just made about sensory motor, was just as effective in explaining what a bacterium does versus what a human does. And in fact, the, the theory is so generic that it actually can't really explain the difference between a bacterium and a, and a human. So at one point he was asked about this. He said, well, you know, so, so, any, but, but, so but, I mean, maybe just, just finish but, about but what John, he said. Our, our, our audience, can, can you go one step back? Like, like, like I, I don't think people will have gotten why, the, why in this view, bacteria and us are the same thing. Well, okay, so the, the, basic, the, the basic idea, right, is that you have, you can imagine a bacteria has a membrane and inside its metabolism is you could imagine is some kind of model of the world. There has to be some, um, some kind of match between the inside of the cell and what it expects to encounter in the outside world, right? And you can actually frame that kind of notion of having to sort of make sure that you don't, as a bacterium, you know, swim into a pool of battery acid, right? So you basically want there to be some kind of match between your model inside of the outside and it's predictive of what you expect to find and then you move and things like that. It's, it's, it's formulated in a Bayesian way. And the interesting thing was is that when he was asked, well, how does one talk about sort of planning to go to college instead of planning to avoid, you know, a noxious stimulus just in front of you? He said something like, well, that's a little bit like when does a pile of sand become when do grains of sand become a pile of sand? It's a continuum. And we don't really know when suddenly you can say cognition has happened and before it was just sensory motor. It just is a continuum that eventually becomes cognitive to answer Megan's question. Yeah. Right? And so the, the point being that this abstract formulation can somehow cope with the distinction along the continuum of walking to the fridge versus wanting to steal a pudding from the fridge. But the problem is, is that the model is so generic that it doesn't actually explain the divide. That's the concern I have to your question, is that maybe we need a second language on top of this formalism. So, so uh, let, let, let's, let's, let's maybe open the various axes that we have. Now, like we have a cognitive versus motor axis we have like a simple beings versus like human-like cognition axis. I think there's a third one that's underlying the Bayesian field, which is when it comes to um, uh, when it, when it comes to the scale where, where we are looking at. You know, like you can say there is we we make statements about behavior where I can say I can use a Bayesian model to predict what happens in a given behavioral experiment. There is a second level where I can say, I look at a bunch of cases, potential problems that animals need to solve, and it can give me insights into what an animal that should care about. Now, like if, if I can make statements about uncertainty is important for the estimation of best locations, um, that fact that I can therefore discover that uncertainty matters gives me some insights into the search for uh, such for the right variables in the brain. And then there is the so-called Bayesian brain hypothesis, where the idea is the brain is made out of Bayesian things. And we have multiple questions that deal with this general idea. For example, here we have one by Kristen Ong, which asks, what are some examples of neural circuits that are known to be Bayesian and other examples that are definitely not Bayesian? So, uh, so, so I'd be curious to have a bit of a discussion about that continuum as we go, like, uh, no, no, you could say, uh, and, and let me like uh, let me project the, the views of some scientists that I really admire. There, for example, the late David Null had this where he says, "I believe behavior will be Bayesian for the following reasons. I believe that we are miles away from ever understanding the brain, and therefore, 
what I try is just understand in a way how behavior can be understood as a good solution to the problem that is there in the world. Uh, at the mid-level, you could say there's a lot of fMRI researchers, uh, maybe Yuta Nopane, there's a whole bunch of others uh, that kind of say, here we look at, say, Bayesian or generally, generally normative models. By the way, here, like, this is my Y hat, no? Um, uh, we have the various Y models and we can look at variables. And then there, there, there are people that are, let's say, Alex Pouget, who says, well, basically, the way a spike goes from one neuron to the other is really an implementation of Bayesian. So I'd be with our three guests today, I'd be curious if I could hear from all of them, like where on that continuum they find themselves. Who, who would like to go first? Maybe, maybe Megan should go first. <laughs> um, that's a big question. Uh, so, uh... But, but, but yeah, I mean, like, I agree it's a big question, but it's, in a way, it's a question that drives for everyone who's in that field. The answer where, which of these three statements you're willing to accept or not will completely color the research you do. You know? Like, if you're, if you're like, look, we want to understand behavior, the rest is hopeless, well, then you will only ever look at behavior. And maybe that's okay. And maybe John would be sympathetic to that view. Whereas, like, if, if you say, I believe the brain is fundamentally Bayesian, then you might want to look at microcircuits and ask where the, where is the reflection of Bayesian in there? So, 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 so can we make a distinction between, between talking about uh, something like, you know, probabilistic population codes or, or sampling as an implementation of, of Bayesian decision-making or Bayesian statistics or Bayesian anything, a distinction between that and just those being ways that the brain represents stochasticity or that where the brain does stochastic computations, because I think that those are kind of different questions. You can have probability, you can have stochasticity, you can have noise, and you can have a completely non-Bayesian system. And so I, I don't think that they're necessarily like talking about implementation level questions necessarily maps directly onto talking about whether the brain is Bayesian or not. They, they definitely relate to each other, but they're not the same question. Right. So I, I I don't I think that I would I would agree with the idea that um, that the brain somehow as especially as someone who who studies metacognition I think that somewhere in the brain there are these ways that the brain deals with uncertainty and either it has uncertain representations that um, that are uh, explicit in the way that they represent uncertainty it just is you know there's a probabilistic population code and or there's like you know, a spatiotemporal pattern of, of spiking that represents samples from, you know, a particular probability distribution. I, I do think that there are ways that the brain explicitly represents or has uncertainty. That, that I would not disagree with. Uh, and I think that there are ways that the brain may explicitly in some kind of higher order summary statistic way also represent the uncertainty in its decision-making process. This is one of the things that we talk about a lot in metacognition is that the brain somehow estimates the uncertainty at some lower level and then does something with that estimation. Whether those computations are Bayesian or not is a completely different question. It can be useful to think about, but they're not, they're not necessarily the same thing. And that's of course another continuum, you know, like where you could say to which level does evolution like set us up with algorithms that are Bayesian versus for which level do we just learn to act like a Bayesian? Basically, we fake it until we make it, and then we look like a Bayesian once you run like your once you fit your Bayesian model tutorial three today to my behavior. But it might be that I'm I'm like that because I've done it ten thousand times. So I, I think that there's a lot of truth to this fake it to your make it kind of thing. That like in an impoverished space that is like in the lab where you're poking circles on a screen or you're localizing flashes of lights and little beeps and stuff. And even in metacognition, where we're asking, you know, here is a left tilted Gabor patch. Did you, you know, is it left or right? How confident are you that there are lots of ways in which a Bayesian or near Bayesian model ends up being appropriate to fit the data um, in these super impoverished spaces? Uh, but then people like Weiji Ma, who go and do like, you know, 10,000 model comparisons in a very comprehensive way, start discovering that here's the Bayesian model and here are like 50 different variants that are not quite Bayesian. And some of them end up actually describing the data better too. 
Uh, but only if you design your experiment explicitly to go ask those questions and you come up with enough alternative models that you don't just say, oh, the ideal observer works pretty good. Okay, well, then that has to be the answer. Um, so the fake it till you make it thing, I think, is, is a, a, very real, um, a very real possibility. But I, think, I think it's like, it's not as um, <clears throat> in our modern polarized world, it's not just black or white, right? We, we can actually say that the kind of spectrums you, you laid out are places where we might be solidly in the middle of all of them. So I think that's where I would put myself. So first off, I believe strongly in thinking about behavior. And I, I, I think that when I wanna ask a question mm. you know, about simple behaviors that, that uh, we and many other animals produce, especially behaviors that are sort of fundamental to our survival, uh, you know, integrating sensory information and knowing whether to run left or right to escape a predator or um, find a nice cheeseburger or whatever it is we need to do. Th these are probably things that because there's like a, a hundred million years of evolution plus behind them, we're going to do okay at, like at least if we're in our normal environment, which isn't necessarily the, the laboratory setting. Um, but that, that doesn't mean that by doing right, which might include uh, estimating information in a way that we would be able to describe as, as, as observers as Bayesian, that the brain is doing a Bayesian computation internally. So I guess in that sense, I think we can be agnostic about that, but it also seems not implausible. For example, we start seeing things that look like uncertainty representations in certain parts of the brain. And, you know, people like Alex and, and Matea and others have, have, you know, tried to see evidence for this. And can I would you, argue- Can you say the whole names? I, I, just saying oh, Alex like one, one walk back. Sorry, one. Alex Puget and, and Matej Liengal. The, these are, are, I mean, Matej is actually one of the people who's, who's really tried to do this kind of experiment to ask this question, but I would say it's like an a, a example of one. So at this point, if you wanted to argue with me about whether or not we know anything about whether any part of the brain is Bayesian at all, I would say no one has sat down to do the experiments. And that's really unfortunate because we have these nice theoretical models that we could go and test, but, oh, it's actually a little bit tricky to test them. I mean, it's, it's sort of what Megan was saying about testing this in behavior. You actually have to do a lot of work to try to distinguish between Bayesian and non-Bayesian. But then there's an even worse problem, right? Because evolution has to be efficient on multiple levels. So it has to be efficient as we actually believe at the energetic level, right? It, it can only expend so many spikes on being good. So why would you expend spikes on sort of representing a continuous set of distributions for everything you need to deal with in the world if in fact a point estimate or a point estimate plus an estimate of variance would do just as fine? And I think that if we ask ourselves, are we Bayesian or not? And our criteria is we must be perfectly Bayesian well, we're not perfectly anything. And in fact, I would push John to come up with a model that, that would describe our cognitive system that would also be perfect in whatever form it is. We don't have candidates for that. But the Bayesian model gives us, I think, good intuitions to ask, is the system doing something that's reasonably integrating various kinds of information it gets? And now I'm going to speculate here just for John's sake for a moment. I would speculate that actually the systems that are producing our higher order cognitive behavior, the things that are doing the complex behavior we're doing right now, which is you're listening to me speak and you're understanding my words. I think there's an enormous amount of the underlying neural machinery that is actually probably behaving in a very Bayesian way. So the bits that are actually estimating what was the word I was saying and what was the concept behind it are, are probably pretty well described in a Bayesian framework. Now, on top of that, maybe the whole thing could be described in some Bayesian framework with you know, some complicated sets of priors. But I think we just don't know the answer. It's also not clear that we're at the point where we should be worrying about that because clearly it's way beyond the kinds of things that we can ask questions about. And I think that's often what, what John's point is in this case. So, so I don't know, I'm, I'm gonna sort of sit myself squarely in the middle saying, I don't think we know. I think we could be approximately Bayesian, which to me would be just as good as being Bayesian because that's actually what I wanna be. I wanna be good enough to do well in the normal parts of my life. 
but as we know, you know, as 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 uh, Wei Ji Ma's pointed out, and as the question earlier from Kahneman Tversky's pointed out, there's clearly lots of domains where we're not Bayesian enough. And but, so I mean, that's can fine. I, so, so, but I mean, just a number of points, just so, you know, and for the for the audience. One is, is I always find it interesting when one just goes into neuroscience. You know, you can either say, well, I'm an fMRI person. Oh, I'm a TMS person. Oh, I'm a Bayesian person. I like, you started by saying, I like reinforcement learning. In other words, I find it really interesting that people feel that they need to identify themselves with their preferred computational methodology or technology. But John, you define yourself as a contrarian. No, 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 that's not, a, that's not an area of neuroscience, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, so the thing is, is what I, so in other words, I agree that one should be pluralistic and one should clearly, like I think Conrad tried with his three versions, what are we trying to do here? You know, there's Bayesian statistics, which is ways to, you know, um, estimate and predict and model select. It's just another area of statistics. So then there's the idea of Bayes in the brain. And then we start saying, well, Bayes in the brain can, meet, can be what the brain is actually doing, or we can do you know, a kind of task construction and then see if the brain does what we consider optimal given the task construction. So those are the three things. Now, if you take really lovely work, I mean, I think there was a paper by Sam Gershon and his group where they were looking at you know, hierarchical um, you know, clustering of an environment and then planning model based on that hierarchical structure of the environment. And then you say, I'm going to build a generative model of what I think humans are doing to guess what this environment is like. And then you do some sort of planning on that. And you come up with lovely empirical results that are like sensory motor experiments, but rather than sensory motor, they're more about how do people plan in a maze that they've learned, and you can use these instruments. That's great, that's really nice science. But most of that work, which I like, is more about the task structure and seeing, given some constraints, how it's learned. But it doesn't answer what you said in what you, you answered me just now, Eric, when you said the concept or the word, you used those two words. You assume that we know what concept and word mean before you plug them into a Bayesian framework. Okay, okay. This, is, this is a great point and I've got a butt in here because I wanted to give time for everyone to see the philosophical components. Now we're, we're, the, the four of us, we aren't all of the same opinion. In fact, between any pair of us, there's ways that we differ and some of us differ very much. But I wanted to now switch to basically going through like the more technical questions. And, um, and I, want to, I want to ask you to first look at Alex Ivanov's question. And I won't read the question, but the, the question is really like, oh my God, tutorial three is super confusing. What the hell is happening? I mean, like that's at least my summary of, <laughs> my summary of that. Um, now, um, and it is super confusing. And uh, please, if it's not confusing to John, Megan, or Eric, interrupt me. It is suddenly, it always was confusing to me. By now I feel like I'm steady state, but it, it's really still confusing. So um, the, the reason why it's so confusing is because it's kind of like inception. Right? Like we have a human being that we look at, our experimental subject. Let's say I bring in John and I do like movement experiments. Right? And he sits there and does it like a, a thousand times. Um, we need a model for what's effectively what's happening within John's head. Now, what is this underlying assumption? The underlying assumption is that John will act optimally. The idea is that John has a likelihood and the likelihood reflects the reality that his brain encoding is a noisy version of the real auditory stimulus. Okay. So, but now once he has his brain encoding, once like this noisy thing goes into the brain, the model assumes that the rest of John is just perfect, like absolutely perfect in every possible way. There's no information loss whatsoever. Once that noisy signal comes in, John's brain does absolutely perfectly. So what that means is that the 
the transition of what goes into his brain, the encoded stimulus, tilde X, to his choice, hat X. That function is a deterministic function. Okay, so in the first half of tutorial three, all that the code does is it calculates that deterministic function. For a John that believes in a certain level of noise and a certain probability that there's a common cause and so on and so forth. Okay, so basically, specifically this, if I remember that right, there's three parameters and we only vary one in the, in the tutorial because otherwise things get very slow. So basically in that view, John is optimal, he has three free parameters. We don't know those free parameters. Now what we can do is we can take those parameters, put it into like a model of John. And then the question is, can we calculate what the model John will answer if we give, if they give the model John an actual XR, an actual stimulus? And yes, that I can calculate if I know the parameters, what model John will do as a function of what X tilde is. And moreover, I know that because of his nervous system has this level of noise on the auditory perception, I know how the distribution of the auditory input that X tilde looks like. And that's what we do all the way at the end, like in part five of tutorial, uh, tutorial three, where we're basically, okay, this is, if this goes in, this is how the distribution of behaviors will look like. And now that we have that, we can basically say, well, now that John, that same John has done thousand trials, for which combination of these parameters in the tutorial is just one of them, does the data that we get from him be, become as probable as possible? And that's the outline there. Now, why is it so complicated? Because once we zoom into John's head, John has probability distributions over what the real stimulus could be and priors and likelihoods and all that. So within John's head, we have basically X tilde going in and X hat going out. But now if I zoom out, I have basically a probability distribution of all the things that could be going into John. And therefore I have a probability distribution for a given trial of what he'd be doing. And so on the outside, I kind of know X, but X is the same variable that John speculates about. So it's the same variable that now appears at least twice. In reality, it appears at least four times. Now, like John reasons or like makes calculations of where it is along that axis. I as experimentalist know where it is on that axis, but he doesn't know what it is. And then he has like somewhere on that same axis, the X tilde is what goes into his brain and X hat is what goes out of his brain. So therefore we have like two, four different variables here. And that is just really confusing. And if you look at the Bayesian behavior literature, they all hide it somewhere so that the reader never has to encounter it. But if you don't encounter it, you cannot understand the logic with which it works. And I know it's extremely hard. And I know that for a lot of people, they will need to go back at it probably for the majority of people they will need to go back to tutorial three if Bayesian models become important for them. But it is just the right way of fitting to the data. It's the only real way of fitting to the data, provided that you want to be full in, fully in that Bayesian behavior framework. And in that sense, I thought it was important to have it in it. And I did know that it was going to be hard. So thank you, Alex, for that question. So I have uh, the next can question. I say one? Can I say one thing? Because I think, you know, there are a lot of people out there who may have felt like they didn't actually understand it. Uh, they struggled to get through it. And that's fine, right? This is the first time you're encountering this particular thing. And it turns out to be something, as Conrad said, that's really tricky. But the nice thing is you have this uh, beautiful set of resources to go back and continue to play with it. Um, and so I, I think like, I, I, now I wanted to speak as I started as a student in one of these schools, right? And then I was a teaching assistant in one of these schools. And then I started running one of these schools. And every year I would sit there and I would listen to many lectures speaking about the same things. And every year I still learn something. So I just think like it's a long road to really understand all of the, the details of how these things work. And you start with the first intuitions, you play with it, then you realize you have another question and you go back and you realize it's a little more complicated. 
and you'll just keep doing that until you become somebody like Conrad, at which point, you know, you have to worry, but it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's okay. Uh, you you and, get to enjoy coffee a lot in life. Uh, can let, I, can let, I say one very, very brief thing that helped me understand this distinction too? Because I, I agree with Conrad, like this is really hard to get. Um, and the, the thing that really drives it home for me is just to try to remember that like your brain, which is doing all these computations that is sitting inside your head, there's a whole lot of stuff between your brain and the outside world. There's your eyeballs, there's the air, there's like a whole bunch of other stuff. And so what your brain has access to is not the thing that's out there in reality. It's a noisy sample or a noisy representation or a weird transformation or something. And that's where this is coming in, is the difference between the thing that's actually out there, if you believe that there is actually a world out there, the thing that is actually out there in the world versus your internal representation of it. There's a lot that goes into that, that tiny step. It's not a tiny step. There's a lot going on. And so just to remember that the only way that you can access the thing that's out there in the world is through this transformation, whatever it looks like, I think that might help uh, drive this home a little bit. Yeah. Okay, so here we have a very important question by Maximilian Nandwich. Are prior likelihood functions usually estimated from data? Or are they optimized similar to the p-independent parameter in this tutorial? Uh, both of them exist. So there exists cases where people measure the prior in the real world. Think about like people walking through the world with a laser scanner to see what the real world distribution of depth is. Or people walking through the world with like super specialized cameras to see how the brightness statistics of the world work. In that case, they get a great prior of the brightness. So that's one possibility. The other possibility is as Maximilian sketched in, like we can do the same thing that we did and basically not just estimate P common, but also estimate uncertainty in uh, the auditory likelihood. And in fact, if we don't assume that vision is perfect as we did, but we allow vision to also be noisy, we can estimate the uncertainty of that as well and so on and so forth. So both these philosophies exist. So in a way, it is closer to the ideal of Y model, of normative models, if we approximate reality and we can basically take those data from the real world instead of having to assume them somehow. The third way how people sometimes do it is they just assume that things are optimal. So you could say, I have a likelihood of a prior, I have, uh, I have maybe some mixing or the P common, and I can say, well, the, the likelihood is something that you experienced for your whole life. We assume that this is correct, that your brain basically will be veridical in that way, in which case you no longer need to estimate it. Now, it varies across papers, and that's why it's such a big literature of very different approaches. Um, personally, I like those best, where you basically go into the world and characterize that. There's like a nice paper of Mark Albert, uh, in, uh, together with, in collaboration with Peter Thier and myself, a bit like eye movement adaptation that uses such an approach. But, but, but they all exist. Uh, cool. So, um, uh, so, so here's a question by Kirsten Ong. Why did we have to estimate the encoded stimulus for e every true value of X? Well, we don't estimate the encoded stimulus. We integrate out over all of them. Uh, why do we need to do that? We can ultimately only, ex uh, uh, only estimate X hat, the estimate that people do. So we need to basically consider all possible values of the variable in between. That's the only way of getting really at the probability, which is what we need if we want to maximize the likelihood of the model. Um, can, I, can I follow on that one actually? Yeah. This, this goes back to what I just said um, about you know, the, the purpose of marginalization um, in, in general. It, it, it's connected to this idea that you, uh, your brain sitting inside your skull, it doesn't have access to the true reality out there in the world. It only has access to its own estimate. And so in order to, to estimate say a, a task relevant variable of interest like if I'm a rat running down, down a maze and like, you know, the cheese is this way or that way based on like the little symbol that I see that's noisy or whatever you're doing, um, you, you don't actually know the true value of like the luminance and the contrast and the other kinds of like things that are out there in the world that might go into your perceptual uh, experience, your decision. And so the way that the brain deals with this is that it kind of integrates out or it, it marginalizes over uh, things that are maybe not quite as relevant um, or that it cannot explicitly estimate. So, um, so this, is, this is kind of 
some of the, the models that came earlier before the causal inference and multisensory perception did this. They would integrate out like the early 90s models where they integrated out things like luminance and, and uh, specularity in computer vision algorithms um, that uh, like Alan Yule's early work with, with Bultoff in like 1993, I think. Uh, they did this where, where again, you're marginalizing out or you're integrating out things that the brain does not have access to and that are also not task relevant because you don't have access to them. You just kind of have to say, I'm not paying attention to that. I'll just assume that one of these things happened. Yeah, so, so uh, we, we, just exceed, uh, we, we just ran for an hour here. So I want to emphasize for everyone, if you want to run off right now, uh, that's totally cool. Everything is recorded in any case, and we'll make sure to upload it somewhere. Um, I, I, we will be going like another five to 10 minutes, maybe, just so that we can go through more of the student questions. And I think it's very important that we get to answer your questions. But if someone is waiting for you, like your kids need food or something like that, please, this is an, an online space. <laughs> like No one will look funny at you if you just walk out right now. And, uh, and I promise we won't even look at how many people log out or log in here. But, uh, but I think for some people it will be useful if we take a few more, a few more of the questions. Sure. So um, let's see. So we have, um, we have a question by Va Vasishta Polisetti, who basically asks, uh, uh, can the brain have continuous utility functions dot? Or is the utility function itself inferred from discrete previous life experiences? That's a great question, <laughs> guys. <laughs> Who takes it? I've been talking a lot. I'll let someone else talk. Well, I guess um, <clears throat> maybe this is the same problem I was trying to address earlier. I mean, I think it's clear in some cases we could and probably do store continuous representations of, of distributions. I mean, I don't think it's been maybe perfectly well demonstrated, but let's say it seems not unreasonable. Um, some models definitely of like early visual inference probably suggest this kind of thing. Um, but when it comes to utility and value, we might or we might not. So, you know, the, as John was teasing me earlier, I said I worked in reinforcement learning. I do like it. It's a nice framework. I happen to think it's about the only framework we have that describes the entire brain. Um, not that I think it wouldn't be nice to have a better one, but it just happens to be the only one I know that actually does this. Um, that maps pretty well to the biology, where we have homologies between various components of the reinforcement learning algorithm, which you'll learn about on Friday, and various aspects of our brain. And there, in at least the simple models, which do a decent first order approximation of describing some aspects of our behavior and some aspects of our brain, we only keep point estimates, right? We only keep just the <coughs> expectation. Um, we don't need to keep the whole distribution. Now, there are other variations of these models that actually keep the full distribution. And in some cases, there seems to be some evidence that we might do it. But in many cases, it seems we don't. Now, why might this make sense? Well, I don't know. You're a person wandering around the world and you have um, lots of things that you need to represent the potential value of. So going home and you know, having a warm bed to sleep in, uh, going to the cherry tree to pick some nice cherries, uh, going to the river to get some fresh water. In fact, you also have to represent the value of deciding, well, which path should I take to get to each of those places? Or would it be better to go down to the pub with Conrad and John and Megan and, and have a beer? Like the, the space of things that we might need to allocate our, our behavior to is quite large. And the brain is, um, relatively speaking, uh, not in infinite. And when you start having to ask questions about the combinations of potential utilities, which we do when we have to think forward, right? So if I want to make one decision now and then another decision, it's, it's going to require calculating a whole series of these um, posteriors over the utility space and doing something that, that would end up exploding. The, the dimensionality will be very large. And if all of those are continuous, it's going to be impossible. Even if they're not continuous, it's probably impossible. 
And so I think it's quite reasonable to suggest that we in some places where it's appropriate represent probably continuous distributions over these kinds of uncertainties. But there are probably many places in the brain where it's just not necessary and we don't do it. And here's an example where we might do something um, slightly less sophisticated. It relates to the discussion Megan and I were having at the beginning. You might keep a point estimate of sort of the variability of your point estimate, right? You, you know, an estimate of your variance. But that's then one number. It's not a continuous distribution. You, your brain makes some kind of assumption like it's in the exponential family or it's a Gaussian. And if, if the brain has a mechanism for representing that, then you have this values, call it confidence or uncertainty, um, but it's no longer really fully Bayesian because unless you're actually representing whatever it is with its true distribution and not some approximation or simplification, you're throwing away information. So you're not being perfectly Bayesian, but that may be good enough. And so <clears throat> I think you have, to quest you have to ask the question about how worthwhile is it to expend the resources to be fully Bayesian? And, and I don't think we know the answer to that, but probably most of the time the answer is it's not necessary. Um, I mean, of course, we experimentalists, we often force that in the lab. We, we set up specific contexts where we're specifically looking to see whether somebody can be Bayesian and, and we, under limited assumptions usually, and then, and then we ask. So I don't know whether that, you think that fully answered the question, guys, or? I think so. And we have a whole bunch more of them. So uh, then the next question is a question by CTA Bakshi, I believe. What other distributions, Ponson and Dirichlet, could be applied for Bayesian statistics? So there are two parts of Bayesian statistics. You now there's a field of statistics that uses Bayesian approaches to solve problems. And then there's people who ask how, what, what we can say about brains there. On the more Bayesian statistics side, if there is a distribution that you have ever heard the name from, it has been used in some Bayesian model in very good approximation. It's a very big field that applies it to a lot of things. Um, here we have the next question. It's a question by Igor Sverev. Brad, can I in, say one thing about that though? Oh, that just sure. because you can use some other distribution in the Bayesian framework doesn't mean that it's a good approximation for what the brain is doing. Necessarily, uh, it could be, but yeah. It's, that's, 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 that's right, but like, let, let's just mention a few of them that are popular when it comes to applications to brains. Now, Gaussians are of course possible, uh, are popular because anything, if you add enough things together, will sort of look Gaussian due to the central limit theorem, as long as they have mm -hmm. the right distribution properties. Um, we often see Ponson distribution when we talk about spike counts. You know, like Ponson is positive, only discrete values. We often find uh, gamma distributions. Um, we find beta distributions. We find T distributions. Um, all of them appear prominently in, in ways of dealing with neural data. And yeah. almost, and, and it used to be that it was very much there were Bayesian statisticians and frequentist statisticians. These days, kind of everyone who works on neural data will kind of use all of those, uh, almost everyone. I, I don't know anyone who very, very strongly is only in two of the fields anymore. And, and it kind of, they solve different problems for us. Say something about this, Conrad. So, you know, I just want to get so the, just so the two questions were great, right? The question that Eric just answered and the question you just answered. So, I, you know, this is a question, I'm gonna be one of the students in the chat room, okay. It seems to me that there is a big difference between implicit assumption that something approximating such a distribution is actually being used, right? Which, you know, you can actually Emilio Bizzi has beautiful experiments in pissed frogs where it looks as though they know and they're purely cervical spinal cord preparations, they can estimate where their limb is in space. They probably do some kind of implicit Q integration for the position of their leg, okay? So it's perfectly okay to act as though they're operating in some Bayesian way implicitly it's as if they have one of this zoo of distributions that you talked about. And, and, I, and, and, and it's an open question again. No one's going to say 
that the spinal cord circuitry is overtly representing one of these distributions, but it's operating as though it were. Now, what I, the question I think I have and everyone has is implicit systems that seem to be behaving in this way versus the kind of story that we heard from Eric, where you're deciding whether to go up a cherry tree or go to a bar or go down to the river, where this is overt. So I just want, I think people would like to understand how to wed your list of potential distributions that can be plugged in to the probability calculus versus the kind of narrative that Eric gave. Am I to understand that basically you overtly have constructed and check your gamma distribution of values? In other words, how do you fit an overt sense of should I go to the pub or should I go home or should I pick cherries, which is a very overt narrative, and how do you wed that with the far more, again, what we prefer, Conrad, the sort of sensory motor implicit, as if it were Bayesian kind of discussion in the brain, the behavior certainly is. So Eric, the question is, is are you saying that people are aware that they're overtly looking up at distributions when they make the kind of decisions that you were talking about? Is, is it, how do you, how do you relate them? So, so John, I don't understand the overtness question. Like, you could your behavior could be perfectly Bayesian without you ever like explicitly overtly knowing about probability but, distributions. Well, what are you looking up? In other words, when 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 Eric's telling a story and you've got these values overtly represented, which is also, as you know, debated. But let's say that in the orbital frontal cortex of primates, you truly have an abstract thing like value. I think the Parthenon is a better piece of art than Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Okay. Are we saying that those things, those abstractions, are being represented as distributions? I'm asking Eric, not you. Yeah, so, so <clears throat> I, I'm, I have an easy way out of this, Conrad. Um, and and I'm gonna I'm gonna try to answer John, and then you can go back to telling us to answer the students' questions. So uh, I think it's actually I, directly related to their question, right? You've got these, you know, these abstract dif different distributions. You talked about value distributions. So yeah. I think we want to find a way to fuse this more mathematical formalism with your choice of three things and what overtly you look at to decide which choice you make. Well, so, so I wanted to point out that I said actually most of those value choices are, I think, probably not done in a completely Bayesian way because you only need a point estimate to sort of get by. So even at the implicit level, I'm not necessarily making the Bayesian claim. So that's sort of way out. But you, know what I'm, but you know what I'm saying. I know what you're getting at. But, but way out number two is, I'm going to now speak as a, uh, I, I had a misspent youth as a philosopher. So I'm going to channel, uh, I guess some, I'll take Dennett. As a, Never misspent if it's philosophy. <laughs> um, as, 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 as I think one could say, we as both scientists and introspectors, that is as humans, don't know what we represent overtly or implicitly. We tell ourselves stories. I talk to you and I say, I think I was going to the cherry tree because I think I wanted to do it. But we know that actually there's often disconnects between the way I would communicate to you about my choice and what I actually do if you sat there and observed. Well, then you're just kicking the can down the road. Right? I am definitely you're... kicking the can down the road, but I'm gonna kick it down the road in a very specific way. I would say if you were to not look at what people say they were doing during their decision making, but look at what they actually do, you would find that more often than not, it looks more Bayesian than not. Or so, let's so say what, it goes so, in that so just so I understand it, what you've done is you've sensory motorized explicit cognition. So you've explained it away 
in a sense by saying, well, what people say and what they're actually doing, they're really zombies, sort of slave to their implicit distributions. And then they tell just so stories afterwards. But yeah, all that I, does I'm, is- If you get me, you know, if you get me to the pub, I will actually say that. But here, I think what I would like to say is, I think that um, one of the problems we have, so, so going back to sort of what you guys were encountering today in the tutorials, and, and it's actually been a thread running through many of these questions in this conversation. You know, we sit as scientists and we take what are social tools. A social tool is mathematics. It's something that we have agreed on as a convention because it's useful for describing the worlds, sending Teslas into space, and, you know, maybe describing the behavior of a mouse in a box using a uh, Gaussian formula. But it is not something that I think is something we should pretend is directly what we're talking about in the brain. This is um, something that uh, we've invented. It's a cultural social thing, right? This, this way of describing things. But we think it's a good description of stuff in the world. And that includes us. And so now I would say, I think it's probably a good description of a bunch of our brain, maybe the way it actually represents and does things. It's definitely a good description, as you've admitted, of a bunch of our behavior. When we go to then say, ah, well, now I want to turn it on this stuff that I think is pretty special. When I look inside and I ask myself intuitively, as a scientist or as a person, you know, am I being Bayesian in my thoughts? I think we just get confused. We're in a space where, um, it, it's not even clear what we're talking about. It's like you said earlier, we have to think about and worry about the words of words and the words of thought. So I'm just gonna put all of that aside and say, I don't wanna get into that debate, at least not until we've uh, gotten a little further along in the course. Um, but I don't think that that means that I'm uncomfortable saying that we could implicitly be Bayesian and then tell ourselves some stories about how we're making choices at this cognitive level, this experiential level, um, that would in fact not always look Bayesian or that we might not be able to describe that way. It's speculation. So, so we could be kind of Bayesian, but our brain would be fitting a Bayesian model to our own responses, trying to make it make up very simple stories about how we work. Like metacognition. Yeah, like well, metacognition. <laughs> I mean, one of the weird things we have to do, right, is we have to serialize and compress whatever is going on in the brain most of the time into language, which is this sort of linear string, which you know is a pretty complicated process and you have to discard a bunch of stuff. So I can't sit there and tell you, well, I was thinking about going to the cherry tree, but actually I wasn't. What I was really doing is I was putting 0.1 probability on thinking about going you know, to do my laundry and 0.3 probability on you know, going over here to buy some widget that I thought I needed. And, because we would never actually have any conversations with ourselves or anyone else. And so I think part of what we might be encountering is, as Megan was saying, we have to marginalize out things that we're not paying attention to. Now I'm, I'm being a little provocative here because I'm not even sure we actually are Bayesian all the way up. I mean, in the space I was describing in utility, I think often we can get away with just using point estimates. But I think we just, we need to be careful about throwing the baby out with the bathwater. The Bayesian framing, I think, is nice because it gives us very clear and, and very complete descriptions about what the best thing to do would be. It forces us to write down our assumptions. And if we think the brain does it, we can actually go and kind of look at it. We do do that in behavior all the time. I would just say for the, for, you know, and I think this is very important, is that, again, I find you fluctuating between sort of having a Bayesian framing of the behavior, right, with some external notion of the cherry tree, the river, the pub, and, and finding, if one were to do what Conrad said, you go out into the world and you can actually gather empirical information of the probabilities of whether that time of day you're going to go here or there, and that's all good. But all I'm saying is that's a Bayesian um, task analysis which puts probabilities in like you just did of going to here or there. And I don't have a problem with that. It's just that that's not a psychological construct, right? That's a task construct. And all I'm saying is that what I think the important thing is, is when you look at the Bayesian formalisms and the distributions and you look at the likelihood and you look at the prior and you look at the posterior, 
all I'm asking is that sometimes it looks like what you're putting in there are probabilities of things happening in the world and the environment and behaviors. And other times you are, you are, you, it looks as though these things are actually psychologically represented internal models. And they're not, and all I'm saying is those two languages and, and you know, they don't have, they may both work, but they're different languages for the same Bayesian formalism. Okay, cool. I, I, I mean, we've been running for 80, 80 minutes now. I think it's time to, to wrap this up. I want to give our three guests one minute each to for some parting words. Who wants to start? Um, I will say to the students that I think that the, the real interesting idea that many of the frameworks that you'll come across, whether it's RL, Bayesian or otherwise, is that we believe that at some point you have, you have some kind of internal model of the world. It's either overt or it's implicit. And that what we're interested in is how do you reason and plan and infer about the world with this internal representation? And I think that's a very useful scientific enterprise. I think it's important to distinguish the mathematical formalisms of choice uh, from that essential question about internal representation and not to confuse the computational optimal framing of tasks with the psychological construction of these internal models. And I would simply ask you to know when you pick your formalism whether it's about psychological entities or whether it's a computational description of optimal behavior that you should be doing with those psychological entities. And, and, I, and I think the, the take home message is don't confuse those two things. Megan. Yeah, so um, I would very much agree with that. I, I uh, thank you for saying it so clearly, John, that was awesome. Um, I think what I will say is, um, is kind of uh, related in that um, when, you're, when we're talking about building these internal models and we're talking about how the brain is dealing with uncertainty and with noise, with stochasticity and, and all of that stuff, that the Bayesian framework is, um, is kind of, as John was saying, only one potential way in which the brain is making use of this internal model, this internal statistical representation of the world. And there are a lot of other models that, uh, that are about probabilistic uh, or ways of combining information in probabilistic fashion that are not necessarily Bayesian. They don't have a prior and a likelihood and, you know, like you don't do this particular thing or, or, or whatever. And so, um, I think that starting with um, Bayesian models and understanding uh, the scope and utility and purpose of uh, formally defining a Bayesian ideal observer, you know, given the noise in the system and the information available to you, what is the best that a system could do? And then understanding, does the system get there or not? And a lot of times it doesn't. And so you have to then say, is it close enough that we can just say, oh, we didn't measure the noise properly, or is there actually some completely different decision rule that's going on? Starting with the Bayesian ideal observers is great because they, like, they're, it's, it's like in any mathematical formulation, there's, you know, the right answer. There's one right answer. There's one optimal solution with this cost function, with this particular uh, set of equations. But it also demonstrates the diversity of other types of ways that the brain might be doing this. And so don't be frustrated if after you've thought about internal representations of the external world and you've specified your Bayesian ideal observer and then it doesn't quite get there in actually describing behavior, that's maybe actually the interesting part. And so then you can start to say, well, maybe I just got the cost function wrong or maybe it's, it's actually not a Bayesian uh, computation at all. And, and so that's when it starts to get really fun. So, so um, Bayes rule and Bayesian statistical models are a good first step in introducing the process of formalizing the questions in this way, but they are certainly not the only tool in the toolbox. Great. Well, all right. 
I guess I want to agree with both John and Megan. In fact, I was going to say basically something akin to what Megan just said. <clears throat> and in that, putting aside for the moment questions about whether our brains are implementing actual Bayesian processes, and just thinking about Bayesian reasoning as a tool for us as scientists, I think it's very powerful in exactly the way Megan said, right? We can use it to make sure we make clear um, statements about what we think the information is that's available to a system. We can make clear statements about whether that system seems to be performing in an optimal way or efficiently using that information. And then we can use that to help us refine our models. And we can compare the sort of abstract computational model at the Bayesian level to various, uh, in, in sort of a Marian sense, algorithmic approximations or heuristics that might be trying to get there that may maybe describe the behavior and we can try to relate these. So to me, whatever else is true, it's useful. And so I think you should learn about it because it's immensely useful. I also started this morning doing this question and answer session uh, in Asia, where we had a very different discussion. Um, so I'm not sure I'm in the best position to now try to do this last bridge, but I wanted to say something to combine, I think my answer to John and, and something for Megan, which is, I don't know, I've always been a little neo-Kantian um, which means I think that there's, you know, some kind of outside world there, but I don't have direct access to it. It's always mediated. I'm, I'm observing things through my noisy sensory system. This was that hard concept that we have to kind of get around that, you know, I don't even know that John and Conrad and Megan exist. Uh, I just infer it from these photons that are coming from my computer screen. Um, and so I sort of think like the, um, the question of, of whether or not we're explicitly or implicitly representing things is, is not where I'm at yet. What I do know is we have to make inferences. Um, so the brain uh, is doing something about inferring stuff about the world and it's using that to make choices. And I don't have a lot of great options for thinking about that, but the Bayesian framework is one and it's a good place to start. So um, I don't know whether I'm, a, I'm, I'm definitely on the end of my day, so I may not have said that as clearly as I would have liked. But anyway, with that, uh, Conrad, why don't you close us yeah. out? I, I just as a closing statement, I first want to remind everyone I have been wearing my pink hat, which means that this was a day that was largely devoted to wine. Um, I want to zoom out a little bit. Much of week two is about various different kinds of wine. Models. Now we're talking about today, how we can best combine two pieces of information. We will ask in the time days, how we can best integrate information over time. In the, in the optimal control uh, day, we will ask how you, we, can make best, uh, we can best make certain decisions. In the reinforcement learning day, we will, uh, we will ask how we can learn to, in a world, to do the best kind of decision. In all cases, it's kind of, in this space between why and the brain, more on the why behavior side maybe than the brain side. So why are you hearing so much about that if, if like this a gulf in a way, you know, like a lot of us perceive this gulf between behavior and uh, be between Bayesian models or like normative why models and, and what we can really say about brains. Well, it turns out that these models are relatively advanced. You know, like I can use a reinforcement learning model and I can be really quite good at predicting what people do or what an animal will do. Um, a lot of other models that we have in neuroscience don't yet have this breadth of explanatory value. So while they kind of feel philosophically alien in a way, they they do describe a lot. And therefore, for a lot of people that have been thinking for a long time about brains, they feel like they're like a bridge of like starting to understand maybe more the mechanistic how processes. Now, if you will come out of this week saying like, yes, these things are useful tools. So if you will reject that and basically say like, look, um, that's not the way I think about the brain. Either way, the, these ideas in lots of ways do form the backbone of thinking about how brains work. 
and therefore like at least learning about them understanding the details understanding what they uh, what they mean and trying to understand how we can fit them to actual data is actually very important and that's why we go through that so thank you everyone for for tuning in enjoy the rest of uh, of nma and i look forward to seeing you more in the future thanks guys this was fun thanks megan conrad eric it was fun yeah thank you all ciao bye